Okay, hello, um, Blue Pathway. So this video is for uh, people who missed um, the second year 10 week um, for physics. Um, for whatever reason, you can come into school. So this is a video to go over the content there. So uh, um, the content was on physics half-life. And half-life is not that hard to get, really. Um, so we're going to go over the key um, features of half-life and what it is and how to do it without a graph and how to do it with a graph and uh, give you some practice questions. So um, on the screen, if I just close my notifications, on the screen you have uh, a gap fill. So pause the video and see if you can um, put the words in the gaps. Okay, if you just come back from pause or you couldn't be bothered to do it, um, we'll go through it. So radioactivity is measured in becquerels um, or counts per minute. One becquerel is one decay per second. The half-life of a source is the time taken for half the nuclei to have decayed. A short half-life means that the activity drops quickly because you have a lot of decays in a short time. A long half-life means that the activity uh, will fall slowly because most nuclei don't decay for a long time. So um, the next thing we then did in class is we, we went through what's called the bubble analogy. And um, so if you imagine a, a giant great big washing up bowl full of uh, frothy um, washing up liquid suds, um, we can kind of use that situation, um, use that visual image to help us understand how a radioactive substance decays. And if you remember, Radioactivity is simply a name for when the nuclei, the, the middle parts of atoms, need to get rid of energy. And they do so by giving out alpha, beta, gamma or neutrons. And they're doing that to become more stable. Okay, So um, if you look at a bowl of soap suds, obviously you see loads of bubbles. And um, this would represent each nucleus in a radioactive source. And looking at the um, the suds again, you would see um, you, you know bubbles popping. A pop of a bubble represents a decay of an atomic nucleus. So um, a pop represents a decay. So if you were to look at uh, a load of soap um, suds, washing up liquid suds in a washing up bowl, you couldn't predict which bubble was going to pop next. That is exactly like the behavior of nuclei in a radioactive source. You can't predict which individual nucleus is going to decay next. Okay, so there's no way of doing that. There's no way of knowing that. So we call this random behavior. Um, how long before all the bubbles pop? Well, if you left a bowl of soap suds overnight, probably when you get up in the morning, there'd still be one or two left. Maybe if you wait another half a day, there might still be one or two left, even though the vast, vast majority of them have gone. Similarly, with a radioactive source, you don't know, you can't say definitely when every single nuclei will have decayed. Um, so some sources have nuclei that decay quickly, some that decay slowly, but there might be the odd two, one or two that, that decay really quickly, much quicker than the others, and there might be, you know, nuclei that decay much more slowly. Um, so you're looking again at your, your soap suds. When will more bubbles pop on average? When there are more of them or less of them? Well, if you want to talk about how many pops, how many bubbles popping per second you would get, if you started off with a bigger uh, mountain of soap suds, um, of washing up liquid suds, you would get, over the first seconds, far more bubble pops 
than you would if you started with a tiny mountain of washing up liquid bubbles. That's exactly like um, radioactive decay. So when you start off with a lot of radioactive nuclei that haven't decayed, you're going to get more decays per second at the beginning as compared to if you, you had a far um, smaller number of radioactive nuclei at the beginning. Um, so the number of undecayed nuclei is proportional to the decays per second. And we, we call decays per second the activity. Um, and we measure that in Becquerel's as the starter slide showed you. So a visual example then. So here we've got a substance um, and we've got 32 undecayed nuclei all, represents, all represented by um, uh, white circles. Um, in two years' time, how many will have decayed? So if you waited two years' time, on average, it's one, you've waited a half-life, and on average, half of them will have decayed. So you can count that now that 16 have decayed, and 16 are under, have, under, have not decayed yet. Um, so how many will have decayed in another two years so you've only got half that haven't decayed yet so you've only got 16 that haven't decayed if you wait another half life then um, you will end up with half of what you have um, after one half life so after two half lives you would end up with eight undecayed nuclei so we can represent this on the graph so um, if we start off with 32 undecayed nuclei and we wait two years, we end up getting 16. Four years, we're left with eight undecayed nuclei. And eight years, um, we end up with uh, 24 decayed and eight undecayed. Half-life curves always have this negative exponential shape. So it curves downwards towards the x-axis, but it never actually theoretically touches it which is very interesting. So what that's really saying is theoretically you will never get to a point where all of your undecayed nuclei at the start will decay. Actually in practice you do get to zero and once you've only got one undecayed nuclei left, um, nucleus left, then that nucleus will either decay or not. So if it decays it drops to zero and if it doesn't it stays at one. So half-life of this sample, so we don't know the half-life here, but we've got some information on our half-life curve. So um, the four points have been plotted with red dots, and the um, curve of best fit has been plotted. So we have to think, well, what is half of 16,000? Because by the time it drops to half of that, that will be one half-life. So half of that is 8,000. We go across from the y-axis with a straight line till it touches our curve, then down vertically to the x-axis. And we haven't got any numbers here between 50 and um, 100. In reality, in the exam, you would have smaller um, increments so that you could get a better read-off. We've got an answer of about 65 seconds here for our first estimate. Um, you could take an, um, another estimate. You could go across with a straight line where my mouse is indicating here and down again. And then you can measure the distance between, in time between your first red dotted line and your second one. And that could be a second estimate of a half-life. And then you could take the mean, which would give you a better, uh, a, a better estimate of that quantity. Okay, a worked example here. So a radioactive source has an activity of 500 becquerel, excuse me, a 5,000 becquerel and a half-life of one year. What's its activity after three years? So at the start, you've got 5,000 um, becquerel. So you plot that, as you can see on the graph. Um, after one year, it halves to 2,500. After two years, it halves again to 1,250. And after three years, it will be half again, which will be 625. I'm not forgetting the units. Becquerels. We write that big B, little q. 
Um, so, next example. The activity of a radioactive source is 640 becquerels. Two hours later, it has fallen to 40 becquerels. What is its half-life? So, it's 6, 4, 640 um, at the start. In one half-life, it would half. In two half-lives, it would half again and quarter. In three half-lives, it would quarter again, and we're down to 80. So we've gone from 640 to 320 to 160 to 80. And then four half-lives again, uh, to half again, and giving us what the question stated originally as 40 becquerels. So it's taken two hours, and each line here represented half an hour. It's taken two hours to do four half-lives. So 2 divided by 4 is 0 0.5. So we can do that actually without a graph. So sometimes you won't be given a graph. So it's the same question again, but we've just done it, you know, um, using numbers. After one half-life, the activity will be 320 becquerels. After two half-lives, it will be 160 becquerels. After three half-lives, it halves again to 80 becquerels. And after four half-lives, it's 40 becquerels. So you've got four half-lives have taken two hours to expire. So two divided by four gives you a half-life of 30 minutes. Okay. So here are two questions. Uh, they're both two marks each. So what I'd like you to do is pause the video. Um, in fact, maybe I'll do it like this. see yep I can get it all on the screen so pause the video here and see if you can do question one part A and B so Amer uh, Ameris Americinium uh, 241. 241 is actually the mass number it tells you the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus um, is an isotope of americinium and remember an isotope is a version of that um, element with a different number of neutrons so it might have more or less neutrons and that makes it unstable so it radioactive uh, it's radioactive it undergoes nuclear decay the graph below shows how the number of americinium 241 nuclei in a sample changes with time so you can see we've got 10,000 uh, nuclei at the start and you can see that the time here is in years half-lives um, and time for radioactive substances to decay can be really quick and it can take seconds or hours or minutes but other other um, radioactive isotopes might have a half-life of thousands or even tens of thousands of years they're both possible all right short short term and um, longer scale half-lives all right so be prepared to deal with both how many years does it take for the number of americinium 241 nuclei to decrease from uh, 10,000 to 5,000 so 10,000 is there um, 5,000 is there and we really we should have drawn this with a straight line it's just hard to do on the PowerPoint but you'd go across with the straight line till you hit the curve down till you hit the axis and the answer done with a straight line is two, sorry, 430 years. You can give yourself the point if you've got four t anything between 420 and 440. Okay, what's the half-life of americinium? So um, it's taken um, 430 years to do that. So, um, so to go to half of its initial value, to drop from 10,000 to 5,000. So that would be exactly the half-life. OK, so you have measured the half-life of the half-life curve. OK, so here's a second question for you. So you can pause the video and have a go at it. 
So let's have a go now. The graph uh, shows how the count rate from a sample of technetium-99 changes with time. Part A. How many hours does it take for the count rate to fall from 530 counts per minute to 150 counts per minute? Um, sorry, 300 counts per minute to 150 counts per minute. Well, uh, the answer is six hours. Uh, if, um, so you would go across with a ruler at this position here and you would go down from this point here and you can see it gives you exactly six hours. So like we did on the last question, you should show that with a line. So what is the half-life of technetium-99? Well, um, we measured the time it took for the count rate to half, uh, which is, by definition, the half-life. So the answer, again, would be six hours or the same as above. So a harder question here. So... Um, Make sure you press pause and give it a go. Okay, let's go through it. Some rocks include, so, so excuse me, some rocks inside the Earth contain a radioactive element, uranium-238. When an atom of uranium-238 decays, it gives out an alpha particle. The graph below uh, shows how the count rate from a sample of uranium-238 changes with time. The graph can be used to find the half-life of uranium-238. The half-life is 4,500 4, million years. Draw on, the, draw on the graph to show how it can be used to find the half-life of uranium-238. So what you would do here is you would go, you would draw a horizontal line across from 500 till it hits the curve, and then down vertically, and if my eyes don't deceive me, that does give me 4,400 where the live line goes. So, actually, I'm a little bit off. Uh, my eyes are a bit skew. So, yeah, it's, it, it is 4,500, so... Um, yeah, uh, a, a line's been drawn there. I must stress again, you should be drawing your your lines on the graph with a straight ruler. There is now half as much uranium-238 in the rocks as there was when the Earth was formed. How old is the Earth? Draw a ring around your answer. So... So the answer to that one, I mean, you don't even need the answers to see it. If the if there is half the amount of uranium-rich 238 in the world, it means that half of it must have decayed. So one half life of time must have expired, which is the same number again, which is two, uh, which is 4,500 million years or 4.5 billion years. Okay. We'll do one more question together, and we'll do it off the Word document. So I want question four here, so I'm just going to manipulate things so you can see it. That's three. That's four. So pause the video here and um, and have a go at this question. And it's out of three marks. So if you've just finished, let's go over the answers. So we're on question number four. So what is meant by the half-life of a radioactive isotope? So please write this down. Is the time taken for the amount or number of nuclei or atoms to half? Um, and actually, 
I really strongly suggest that you say number of undecayed nuclei. Or it's giving you credit for the time taken for the count rate to fall to half of its initial value. You could also say, which would probably be acceptable on most mark scheme, that it's the time it takes for the activity to half. So you do need to learn um, the uh, a suitable definition for half-life. Figure 1 shows how the count rate from a sample of radioactive isotope varies with time. Use the, um, use the information from Figure 1 to calculate the half-life of the radioactive isotope. So again, you sh this is the third time of doing this, this process. It starts off at 80 as the count rates per minute. You should already know now that you need to draw a horizontal line across from the y-axis so it hits the, the curve from 40 because one half-life would be the time it takes to decay for the count per minute to drop from 80 to 40. So And it would give you 60 days. And um, they've given a tolerance. So I'll stop there. That's the very basics of half-life questions. Um, so uh, I hope that's helpful to you going forwards.